I know that it's usual for the chairman on this occasion uh, to introduce the speaker. Well, if there's anybody here who doesn't know <laughs> practically everything there is to be known about Sir David, you shouldn't. I don't know why you've come. <laughs> so I will take it you know exactly who's going to talk to you, and you know exactly how much he, uh, how, how much interest he takes in in the future of the globe. And I think um, all I can say is to thank him very much for sparing the time to come and talk to us this evening. Fifty years ago, on April the 29th, a group of far-sighted people in this country got together to warn the world of an impending disaster. Among them were a distinguished scientist, Sir Julian Huxley, a bird-loving painter, Peter Scott, an advertising executive, Guy Mountford, and a powerful and astonishingly effective civil servant, Max Nicholson, and several others. They were all, in addition to their individual professions, dedicated naturalists, fascinated by the natural world, not just in this country, but internationally. And they noticed what few others had done, that all over the world, charismatic animals that were once numerous were beginning to disappear. The Arabian oryx, which had once been widespread all over the peninsula, had been reduced to a few hundred. In Spain, there were only about 90 imperial eagles left. The Californian condor was down to about 60. In Hawaii, a goose that had once lived in flocks around the lava fields of the great volcanoes had been reduced to 50. And a strange little rhinoceros that lived in the dwindling forests of Java to about 40. These were the most extreme examples. But whenever naturalists look, they found that species of animals were populations that were falling rapidly. This planet was in danger of losing a significant number of its inhabitants, both animals and plants. Something had to be done and that group determined to do it. They would need scientific advice to discover the causes of these impending disasters and to devise ways of slowing them and hopefully stopping them. They would have to raise awareness and understanding of people everywhere. And like all such enterprises, they would need money to enable them to take practical action. And they set about raising all three. Since the problem was an international one, they based themselves not here, but in the heart of Europe, in Switzerland. And they called the organization they created the World Wildlife Fund. As well as the international committee, several separate action groups would be needed in individual countries. So a few months after that inaugural meeting in Switzerland, this country established one, and it was the first country to do so and you, sir, became its first president. Then, after 20 years, you became the international president of the entire organization, which is known today as the World Wide Fund for Nature. The methods WWF used to save these endangered species were several. Some, like the Hawaiian goose and the oryx, were taken into captivity in zoos and bred up to, into a significant population and then taken back to their original home and released. Elsewhere, in Africa, for example, great areas of unspoilt country were set aside as national parks where the animals could be protected from poachers and encroaching human settlement. In the Galapagos Islands and in the home of the, Rwanda, of the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, ways were found of ensuring that local people who also had claims on the land where such animals lived were able to benefit financially by attracting visitors. Eco-tourism was born. The movement as a whole went from strength to strength. 
24 countries established their own WWF national appeals. Existing conservation bodies, of which there were a number in many parts of the world, but which had largely been working in odd isolation, acquired new zest and international links. New ones were founded, focusing on particular areas or particular species. The world awoke to conservation. Millions, billions of dollars were raised. And now, 50 years on, conservationists who've worked so hard and with such foresight can justifiably congratulate themselves on having responded magnificently to the challenge. And yet, now, in spite of a great number of individual successes, the problem seems bigger than ever. True, thanks to the vigor and wisdom of conservationists, no major charismatic species has yet disappeared. Many are still trembling on the bink, but they are hanging on. Today, however, overall, there are more problems, not less. More species at risk of extinction than ever before. Why? 50 years ago, when the WWF was founded, there were about 3 billion people on Earth. Now, there are almost 7 billion over twice as many, and every one of them needing space. Space for their homes, space to grow their food, or get others to grow it for them, space to build schools and roads and airfields. Where could that come from? A little might be taken from land occupied by other people, but most of it could only come from the land which, for millions of years, animals and plants had had to themselves, the natural world. But the impact of these extra millions of people has spread far beyond the space that they physically claimed. The spread of industrialization has changed the chemical consistency of the atmosphere. The oceans that cover most of the surface of the planet have been polluted and increasingly acidified. And the Earth is warming. We now realize that the disasters that continue increasingly to afflict the natural world have one element that connects them all, the unprecedented increase in the number of human beings on the planet. There have been prophets who've warned us of this impending disaster, of course. One of the first was Thomas Malthus. His most important book, an essay of the principle of population, was published over 200 years ago in 1798. In it, he argued that the human population would increase inexorably until it was halted by what he called misery and vice. Today, for some reason, that prophecy seems to be largely ignored or at any rate disregarded. It's true that he did not foresee the so-called Green Revolution, which greatly increased the amount of food that can be produced in any given area of arable land. And there may be other advances in our food producing skills that we ourselves still can't foresee. But such advances only delay things. The fundamental truth that Malthus proclaimed remains the truth. There cannot be more people on this earth than can be fed. Many people would like to deny that this is so. They would like to believe in that oxymoron sustainable growth. Kenneth Boulding, President Kennedy's environmental advisor 45 years ago, said something about this. Anyone who believes in indefinite growth in anything physical on a physically finite planet, he said, is either mad or an economist. <laughs> the population of the world is now growing by nearly 80 million a year, one and a half million a week, a quarter of a million a day, 10,000 an hour growing. In this country, it's projected to grow by 10 million in the next 22 years. All these people in this country and worldwide, rich or poor, need and deserve food, water, energy, and space. Will they be able to get it? I don't know. I hope so. 
You may have seen the government's foresight report on the future of food and palming. It shows how hard it is to feed the seven billion of us who are alive today. It is the many obstacles that are already making this harder to achieve. Soil erosion, salinization, the depletion of aquifers, overgrazing, the speed of plant diseases as a result of globalization, the absurd growing of food crops to turn into biofuels to feed motor cars instead of people, and so on. So it underlines how desperately difficult it's going to be to feed a population that is projected to stabilize in the range of 8 to 10 billion people by the year 2050. It recommends the widest possible range of measures across all disciplines to tackle this. And it makes a number of eminently sensible recommendations, including a second green revolution. But surprisingly, there are some things that the report does not say. It doesn't state the obvious fact that it would be much easier to feed 8 billion people than 10. Nor does it suggest that the measures to achieve such a number, such as family planning and the education and empowerment of women, should be a central part of any program that aims to secure an adequate food supply for humanity. It doesn't refer to the prescient statement 40 years ago by Norman Borlaug, the Nobel laureate and father of the first Green Revolution, he produced new strains of high-yielding, short-straw, disease-resistant wheat, and in doing so, saved thousands of people in India, Pakistan, Africa, and Mexico from starvation. But he warned us that all he had done was to give us a breathing space in which to stabilize our numbers. The government's report anticipates that food prices may well rise with oil prices, and makes it clear that this will affect poorest people worst and discusses various ways to help them. But it doesn't mention what every mother subsisting on the equivalent of a dollar a day already knows, that her children would be better fed if there were four of them around the table instead of 10. These are strange omissions. Another impressive government report on biodiversity published this year, Making Space for Nature in a Changing World, is rather similar. It discusses all the rising pressures on wildlife in the United Kingdom, but it doesn't mention our growing population as being one of them, which is particularly odd when you consider that Europe, England rather, is already the most densely populated country in Europe. Most bizarre of all was a recent report by a Royal Commission on the Environmental Impact of Demographic Change in this country, which denied that population size was a problem at all, as though 20 million extra people, more or less, would have no real impact. Of course, it's not our only or even our main environmental problem, but it's absurd to deny that, as a multiplier of all the others, it is a problem. I suspect that you could read a score of reports by bodies concerned with global problems and see that population is clearly one of the drivers that underlies them all, and yet find no reference to this obvious fact in any of them. Climate change tops the environmental agenda at present. We all know that every additional person will need to use some carbon energy, if only for firewood for cooking, and will therefore create more carbon dioxide, though, of course, a rich person will produce vastly more than a poor one. Similarly, we can all see that every extra person is or will an extra victim of climate change, though the poor will undoubtedly suffer more than the rich. Yet not a word of it appeared in the voluminous documents emerging from the Copenhagen and Cancun climate summits. Why this strange silence? I meet no one who privately disagrees that population growth is a problem. No one, except flat earthers, can deny that that planet is finite. We can all see it in that beautiful picture from our Earth, of our Earth taken from the Apollo mission. It remains an obvious and brutal fact that on a finite planet, human populations 
will quite definitely stop at some point. And that can only happen in one of two ways. It can happen sooner by fewer human births, in a word, by contraception. That's the humane way, the powerful option which allows all of us to deal with the problem if we collectively choose to do so. The alternative is an increased death rate, the way in which all other creatures must suffer through famine or disease or predation. That, translated into human terms, means famine or disease or war over oil or water or food or minerals or grazing rights or just living space. There is, alas, no third alternative of indefinite growth. The sooner we stabilize our numbers, the sooner we stop running up the down escalator. Stop population increase, stop the escalator, and we have some chance of reaching the top. That's to say, a decent life for all. To do that requires several things. First and foremost, it needs a much wider understanding of the problem, and that will not happen while the absurd taboo on discussing it remains such a powerful grip on the minds of so many otherwise worthy and intelligent people. Then it needs a change in our culture, so that while everyone retains the right to have as many children as they like, they understand that having large families means compounding the problems their children and everybody else's children will face in the future. It needs action by governments. In my view, all countries should develop a population policy. Some 70 countries already have them in one form or another and give it priority. The essential common factor is to make family planning and other reproductive health services freely available to everyone and empower and encourage them to use it. Though, of course, without any kind of coercion. According to the Global Footprint Network, there are already over 100 countries whose combination of numbers and affluence have already pushed them past the sustainable level. They include almost all developed countries. This country is one of the worst. There, the aim should be to reduce over time both the consumption of natural resources per person and the number of people, while, needless to say, using the best technology to help maintain living standards. It's tragic that the only current population policies in developed countries are, perversely, attempting to increase their birth rate in order to look after the growing number of old people. The notion of ever more old people needing ever more young people, who in turn will grow old and need ever more young people, and so on ad infinitum, is an obvious ecological Ponzi scheme. <laughs> I'm not an economist, nor a sociologist, nor a politician, and it's from their disciplines that answers must come. But I am a naturalist. Being one means that I do know something of the factors that keep populations of different species of animals within bounds, and what happens when they don't. Thanks to our intelligence and our ever-increasing skills and sophisticated technologies, we can avoid such brutalities. We have medicines that prevent our children from dying of disease. We develop ways of growing increasing amounts of food. But we have removed the limiters that keep animal populations in check. So now, our destiny is in our hands. There is one glimmer of hope. Wherever women have the vote, wherever they are literate, and have the medical facilities to control the number of children they bear, the birth rate falls. All those civilized conditions exist in the southern Indian state of Kerala. In India as a whole, the total fertility rate is 2.8 births per, person, per woman. In Kerala, it's 1.7 births per woman. In Thailand last year, it was uh, 1.8 per woman, similar to Kerala. 
But compare that with the Catholic Philippines, where it's 3.3. But what can each of us do, you or I? Well, there's just one thing I would ask. Break the taboo in private and in public as best you can and as you judge right. Until it's broken here, until it's broken, there is no hope of the action we need. Wherever and whenever we speak of the environment, add a few words to ensure that the population element is not ignored. If you're a member of a relevant NGO, invite them to acknowledge it. If you belong to a church, and especially if you're a Catholic, because its doctrine on contraception is a major factor in this problem, suggest they consider the ethical issues involved. If you have contacts in government, ask why the growth of our population, which affects every department, is yet no one's responsibility. Big, empty Australia has appointed a sustainable population minister. So why can't small, crowded Britain? The Hawaiian goose, the oryx, the imperial eagle, which sounded the environmental alarm 50 years ago, were, you might say, the equivalent of canaries in coal mines, warnings of impending and even wider catastrophe. Every one of these global problems, social as well as environmental, becomes more difficult and ultimately impossible to solve with ever more people.